Welcome everybody to our author visit tonight. Uh, coming to you from uh, from New York is uh, Kristen Radke, who is graciously joining us tonight to talk about what she does in particular, this lovely book here, CQ. And also she has written another book, Imagine Wanting Only This. Uh, she's unique in that she's a writer, an illustrator, an art director, an editor, a multimedia person, all in one. And so her books have a unique way of telling a story visually as well as in the words. Uh, she's a keen observer of the human condition. And uh, really, she pulls a lot of things that you wouldn't think are related together in these books. And if you haven't read uh, the book yet, I recommend you do soon. Um, but I think I'm just going to at this point say, Kristen, welcome to the program. And hey. Uh, say hey. Hi, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. um, should we start with, should I do like a little reading first, Gary, or what do you think? Why don't, why don't we wait a bit for that? Okay. Let's just get to know you first. Cool. First of all, why don't you just give us a, a brief sketch of how you came to be where you are? Sure. Um, I How I came to be where I am. Wow, what a complicated question, actually. It's complicated, uh, I know, but... <laughs> Um, I started, um, I, I published my first graphic novel in 2017, my first graphic nonfiction book, and I started working on CQ um, in the beginning of 2016. And I, um, I kind of just worked my way into being, into working in that form. Like I, I was always writing and I was always drawing, but it took me a long time to realize there was kind of a way that they could work together. Um, and that's kind of how I found um, what I'm doing. Yes, and uh, I think what's unique is that uh, she doesn't just tell the stories of, of this and that, she weaves her story into it because you've really, you've really been everywhere and have a lot of thoughts about how things might be. So let's talk about CQ, which is a, a book about a timely topic, loneliness. And loneliness isn't always bad, but it's perplexing and it's especially now. It's something everybody's learning to live with. Why did you want to study loneliness and do a book about it, Kristen? I it's it's I can never really pinpoint the origin of a project because it feels like it just it, it's something you're thinking. No. It, you don't realize that you're thinking about it or that you're you're working on a project. I think when it's becoming like you're just sort of observing something or or not really realizing that. Um, all of the all of these things you're maybe percolating over have something in common and they're all about a specific theme I think that's how it was for loneliness I found myself kind of interested in science and um, the way that uh, people were depicted like alone on television or things like that and I didn't necessarily realize that they were all a part of the same exploration so I started working on it in late 2016 um, and I started with this I started by drawing it actually I, I did this series of people alone in public places because New York is just such a great place to observe people who are alone and people spend a lot of time alone in New York. Um, like it's very normal to you know eat dinner by yourself and things that in I, I think in certain other towns it, um, it's a little more uncommon. So it's a great place to observe people when they're alone, and I just started thinking and kind of asking questions from there like what what is loneliness um, like why do we feel loneliness. And, and I guess it just snowballed from there. And I guess you've also looked at how people can feel lonely even when they're surrounded by people like in yeah. New York, even when they're surrounded by family, friends and loved ones, there can still be loneliness. Yeah, and, and uh, loneliness really has nothing to do with the amount of time you spend alone. So um, everyone has a different biological threshold for the amount of loneliness that they can tolerate or for how likely they are to feel lonely. And there's nothing you can do to change that, which is why some people like to spend a lot of time by themselves and other people um, don't. They want to kind of always be in constant contact. So that's sort of built into us. And then we, we can, and we can feel that basically, I think about one of the things that Gary and I talked about before was that in the book, I write about how loneliness is the gap between the relationships you have and the relationships you want. And that's kind of like a simple way to think about, um, think about loneliness, because it doesn't mean that you don't even, you don't have people in your life that you love or who love you. It just means there's something, um, there's still something missing. Like maybe there's a person missing or, um, you know, someone you can, someone with whom you can talk to about something um, that you feel like you can't in your current relationships, things like that. 
I guess loneliness in many ways is, is also about being, as you say in the book, outside of something. Mm -hmm. And whether that's a group or a family or, or, or maybe a profession or, or the kids at the lunch table. Yeah. You're outside and loneliness really is a response deep in the brain from a long time ago because there was a time when you, if you were lonely, not part of the group, you would die. Yeah, exactly. Like when we were very, um, when we were hunter gatherers, we were very nomadic. We traveled in groups. And if we got separated from that group, we were, you were in danger. Like maybe it was too cold. Maybe you couldn't hunt by yourself. Maybe there's a wild animal and no one's there to warn you, uh, to run or something like you need people, you needed people around you or you, or you couldn't make it on your own. So the, their, your brain really can't tell the difference between physical pain and emotional pain. So when we're lonely, it's kind of like this warning alarm bell and it's trying to propel us back towards a group because that's where we're safe. So it's this real, it's this real defense mechanism, this kind of basic lizard brain defense mechanism. And we still have that same feeling. Like we still, those same hormones still rush through our bodies when we feel alone. It's just now we spend a lot of time um, at our computers and on Zoom. So it's a completely different environment where we're still having those same chemical and hormonal reactions. Let's talk a little bit about the technological thing, because in your book, um, you have some stories, first of all, about your father doing ham radio mm -hmm. and how oftentimes you don't have a conversation. You just, ah, we talked. Yeah. And then as you grew up with uh, computers of increasing sophistication, chat rooms, blogs, how you kind of put yourself out there and weren't sure maybe what people were thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the, the internet is, you know, my evolution, my kind of my experience with the internet was since it started basically when I, at the beginning of like when I was in eighth or ninth, eighth or ninth grade, like people were starting to get, you know, dial up internet in their homes. So it was really a big part of my development, but as I was changing, the internet was changing a lot too. In the beginning, the internet did almost feel like a more private space. Like there wasn't social media in the way we have social media now. Like it felt like you could you could hang out on this one part of the internet and it was it was almost like it was it felt more private it felt like um small little isolated communities and now everything feels like you know much more on blast i think with the internet um so it's just i think it does change that sense of of being perceived kind of like what you're talking about gary mm -hmm. yeah it's like you're presenting yourself as you would like to be ideally and so yeah. are other people yes who could tell what's real or what's not yeah, yeah. And it's that anxiety, the FOMO, that comes back to this whole, if you don't belong, you will survive, even if you just don't believe you belong. Yeah. I mean, basically loneliness is a, is a, is a thing that you feel. It's a, it's, a, it's a personal feeling. So it's something you can feel even if um, your community around you perceives you as a member of the group and if you've, that you are included and accepted. So... Let's talk about something that uh, I'm looking forward to you showing us. You're, we're going to do a reading with pictures mm -hmm. of a section in your book that deals with uh, laugh tracks. Yes. And a lot of people, you don't hear laugh tracks much anymore. It sounds kind of yeah. cheesy. And people, I think, understand, well, yeah, it's to get people to laugh. But I think you've dug into it. There's more to it than that. And it's like, whoa. So <laughs> I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Great. And you can tell the story of the laugh tracks. Awesome. Can you see that, Gary? Yep. Okay. Can everybody great. else see it? Good. As cul de sacs were being paved and shiny nameplates staked outside new developments in the domestic lull after World War II, the television laugh track was born. Suburban sprawl made way for a boom in private entertainment. Radios and TVs at home held a hassle-free allure over downtown theaters. Creating defined spaces around oneself was so foundational to the 20th century American dream that separation was part of its formula. When a down-home comedian named Bob Burns appeared on Big Crosby's radio show in the early 50s, the live studio audience went crazy over jokes the show writers deemed too inappropriate to air. They howled, slapping their hands against their thighs. The producers cut Bob's jokes but kept recordings of the laugh he procured. And when a less funny guest later appeared on the show, they spliced in the week's old laughter and put it on the radio. 
Early television comedies were often filmed before an audience too, though generally the performance was repeated several times, the actors running the same scenes again and again so they could be recorded from different angles. But a room full of real people couldn't be relied upon to react like they were supposed to. Sometimes they laughed before the punchline, or they didn't laugh hard enough, or they laughed in excess, too long and too loudly. A sound engineer at CBS said to fix the problem by inserting additional laughter or fading it out when a joke didn't land as intended. The technique was named sweetening. He built a machine that procured, produced laughter with the turn of a wheel. The device contained hundreds of distinct laughs, all designed to sound like real people or prototypes of real people. One was named housewife giggles, another was constructed to replicate the hollow response of someone who doesn't get the joke but laughs along anyway. The goal was to create the sounds of a room that the viewer wanted to be inside. A fabrication designed to make the unreal more real or at least recognizable. The laugh track of 90 sitcoms trained me toward a cultural consciousness I didn't know existed until I saw it performed on the old TV I'd found in the basement and hid in my bedroom closet. When I arranged its antennas at the carefulest angle, I could crank its knob to a single nearly static free channel. I watched at a volume one notch above mute so my parents couldn't hear from their bedroom across the hall. Friends reruns aired at 9.30 every night, and though I didn't understand many of the jokes, the audience's laughter taught me what I was supposed to find funny. Just as I was learning the rules of Friends and came to understand its cadence, the show lost its time slot to Spin City, and a few months after that, Frasier took its place. Each time the show changed over, the loss felt insurmountable. I had resisted these new characters each time, was even disoriented by them but inevitably grew to love them all, only to discover one night without warning that they were gone. But each new 22 minute offering brought with it an education too. This is what friendship is, I thought. This is what love looks like. This is what my life might become. The laugh track of each show was a lesson in what I was supposed to feel and know and a promise for something I could someday be. Actor David Niven called the laugh track the single greatest affront to public intelligence I know. It's true that laugh tracks were implemented largely because producers didn't trust their audiences enough to know what was funny. A laugh track tells a viewer when they should laugh. But this limited explanation ignores basic tenets of human biology. People process sounds like laughter, crying, and screaming through the region of the brain that prepares facial muscles to move in ways that align with the sounds they're hearing encouraging them to unconsciously mimic someone else's joy or distress. The premotor cortex responds more rapidly to positive sounds like laughter than it does to noises associated with pain or discomfort. The brain releases endorphins when a person engages in social laughter, suggesting that it's used to build and reinforce long-term relationships. It makes us feel good and we wanna feel good again. Evolutionary biologists posit that laughter preceded language. Primates and airy humans used airy, laugh-like panting to signal the advent of play. Deep, uncontrolled laughter remains the most animal sound humans make. Neuroscientist Robert Provine spent the late 90s documenting laughter, using a tape recorder to capture the sounds of strangers in everyday settings. He found that humans were a full 30 times more likely to laugh when they were grouped than when they were by themselves. The laugh track functions by coaxing a solitary viewer into a sense that she isn't, in fact, alone. stop there. Thank you. I think now if you haven't read the book by now, anybody out there, you're getting a sense of how these things are all, you know, your life, uh, some science, some social science research, mm -hmm. pop culture, it's all connected. And I just thought maybe you had a thought on this. Laugh tracks haven't really been a thing for a while now. Do you think people yeah. get the jokes now or what do you think has changed? It's a great question. I was wonder. I was. I've been thinking about that myself when I was writing about it, and I. I feel like it. It was just like a trend that kind of fell out of fashion. I do also think television has gotten much more complex. Like we as viewers have gotten, have gotten used to more complex storytelling, or producers have caught up to the fact that humans have always been capable of more complex storytelling. Like if you compare a show, you know, like a sitcom from the fifties, sixties 
than the 90s now, like the 2020s, like the writing, the, the number of narratives and stuff are more complicated and there's more, you know, they trust that an audience can remember, you know, a, a larger cast of characters instead of circumstances. So I think probably that's part of it. I think you've nailed that. I mean, a, a lot of the, uh, the shows back then, they were just trying to make sure that people were um, feeling like they were in a, in a studio audience or in a, yes. in a theater. Because mm -hmm. people weren't used to that. And I guess if there was a laugh track, people wouldn't know what to do. They yeah. know what to do now. They're more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, there's a few other things I wanted to ask you about that are in your book. There's a whole chapter about cowboys. Cowboys, yes. And that whole representation of uh, the American uh, loner who they're okay to be alone because, you know, um, um, my work is done here. I'm leaving this town. Talk a bit about your fascination with the cowboy-like things, and and you spend some time living on Las Vegas too. So yeah, big connection to that. So I mean, I think that the so the cowboy is obviously this very American story. It's like it's so foundational to so many of our films and you know novels, and um, even today when we have a TV show set out of the West, it's still often when there's a male hero, it's he's still kind of like a cowboy type, and. Um, I think that's also kind of wound up in ideas about how American individualism and how we really have to do things on our own. Like there's this whole, um, there's a real make it on your own ideology. And like, we love outsiders in America and like underdogs and like, that's the cowboy. Um, and so I think it does feel to me very, very ingrained in, in the way that we see um, what makes someone a hero in this country and, and how that hero has a relationship to one's community. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and yeah, just Las Vegas is a very weird place in yeah. general. Uh, it is. It's a great place though. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's one of these places where I think people have a lot, make a lot of assumptions about it and, and about loneliness in Las Vegas. You know, there's this, um, because it's such a kind of garish place in certain um, parts and, and because it has just this reputation for, you know, kind of like debauchery and destruction, it, it feels, um, I think people kind of, kind of cast the, this pall of loneliness onto it um, in a way that's very interesting. Okay. Um, let's move on a little bit to uh, some of the psychology behind that. And there's a lot of scientists and social scientists you've quoted in this. I know, you know, it's funny how um, Robert Putnam's book, uh, Bowling Alone, yeah. 2000 came just before a lot of things really changed. And a lot of the tenants are still there. It doesn't really talk about the internet at all, as you mentioned. But, oh. uh, and I guess he's actually a professor at Bowling Green. So, um, oh, I didn't know that. An Ohio connection as well. Oh. But yeah, the loss of community often voluntarily because people are too busy or got their own stuff going on. Exactly. So Bowling Alone is a, was a really important book. Bowling Alone is uh, basically kind of serving how um, community engagement has changed. And it's, it's basically talking about how uh, things like PTAs and bridge clubs and bowling leagues have kind of fallen out of favor. Like they're not, people aren't as active in those spaces anymore. And he's sort of investigating those consequences. Mm -hmm. If only he could see what was coming in the next 20 years. <laughs> um, the one scientist, of course, that you spend the most time on and the most fascinating is a uh, Harry Harlow. Mm -hmm. well, ironically, I guess, uh, was, was mostly working in, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering how you, really found that. I mean, a lot of people have heard about what he's done, yeah. the whole wire mother monkey. The wire mother, yeah. Versus the soft fuzzy mother. Yeah. But if you could just give us a bit of a rundown on on how this happened and not, sure. yes, because there's the experiments, but then there's every, the story behind it about him. So yeah. I'll let you hold forth. Yeah. So Dr. Harry Harlow was the um, very famous scientist who studied maternal bonds in um, monkeys. And so you probably saw pictures like in your psych class in high school of like the wire mother, like Gary mentioned, that was, um, and then one that was made of cloth. And it was meant to either prove or disprove the understanding at the time that babies only loved their mothers because they fed them, because they provided food. And so only the wire mother dispensed milk in this cage. And the presumption was that it would prefer the wire mother, but it didn't. It wanted the cuddly, comfortable one. Um, and it became extremely attached to that figure, even though it, it, it you know, didn't give it anything it technically needed to survive, like food. 
Um, and so it led to all of these questions and it, it kind of reframed, it was kind of part of the catalyst that reframed the way that we understand how we raise children because the parlance and the understanding of the time was that we shouldn't um, be too affectionate with our children. Like uh, we shouldn't, it's not worth the risk of passing germs along to our children. We shouldn't like hug them or cuddle them and things like that. And this was one of many um, steps in a process that kind of started dispelling that, which was very important for us to develop, to learn how to develop bonds when we're young. But along the way, as he's doing these studies, Harry Harlow is suffering a lot from depression and, and having some struggles in his personal life. And his studies get um, kind of progressively darker and darker. And he becomes kind of obsessed with replicating isolation and understanding the feelings of isolation in the monkeys. So he does things like um, isolates them from um, their colony for like upwards of a year, things like that, like these really horrible, um, torturous experiments. Um, and I just became really fascinated by him. Like, I think I read everything I could find that he'd ever written. And I read everything about him that I could find. And I, I just, um, even though he was the subjective villain, like he, he did a lot of really horrific things. I was interested in the kind of experiment of trying to understand him and empathize with him and, and write about him in an empathetic way. To understand that he was probably lonely himself yeah. and was always looking for relationships and connections that he couldn't have even with yeah. his own family and his professional yeah. world. And maybe some of that kind of got, you know, how things get warped and come out as anger or in his case, yeah. cruelty. Yeah. Um, like I'm doing this for the good of society, but boy, am I going to be cruel to these poor monkeys? Yeah. And it was, you know, and it's like, I don't, I don't give Harlow, Harry Harlow a pass for any of that stuff. Like, I don't think he was, um, I don't think he was a, a good, it, really ultimately like a positive force, certainly for the people in his life. Like he was, he was quite a, a negligent father and partner um, within his own family. But I am interested in, in how um, someone even who is objectively, um, you know, not an ideal person has this impact on the way we understand something like loneliness and how those studies change over time and kind of how we understand the studies um, and kind of how our own sort of cultural and scientific moment kind of casts a different understanding of, of science from a different era. Yes, there's a lot of big cultural gap between yeah. say, the 40s and 50s and exactly and what people thought was important and uh, yeah. wouldn't discuss even, but now yeah. they can't. Yeah. So I really thank you for bringing that uh, kind of dark chapter of a person in a, in a movement because uh, I, I was just scratching my head and like imagining that, yes, there are cruel people out there. And um, yeah. and um, I don't know how to, maybe they can't be fixed. Maybe they don't want to be, mm. um, but it's really too bad that a lot of these divisions in society, I think as you alluded to earlier in the book. Yeah um an us and them sort of thing yeah exactly mm -hmm. which is a really which is i think one of the things that i that is um most unfortunate about uh it's very human it's very human nature to sort of view um to try to categorize things as like th this is me and these are my people and this is everyone else mm -hmm. and it's, it's it's something we really need to fight against because it's a very destructive impulse mm -hmm. and kind of this th that feeling of the gap between you and and everyone else it becomes more exacerbated the the longer you spend kind of in states of isolation and the, the more lonely you feel because you become you lose your threshold for trusting new people which is um essential for for creating a new relationship is being able to trust someone like with a lot of friendships you said um a lot of friendships are based on the fact that you have basically given somebody enough ammo to uh, yeah. destroy you with yeah totally of these secrets yeah what keeps the trust Exactly. Yeah. I mean, your friends are, it's a, um, you give, you give them information every day that could harm you. It's kind of like you're, you're making yourself vulnerable to them in a lot of ways. And that's um, a, that's, that shows a real measure of trust. That's an extraordinary bond. I mean, being bonded together by, um, a shared experience or by disclosure, like that's one of the main ways that we, that humans bond with each other is by sharing, um, things that, that are very emotional and significant to us. And maybe um, part of the issue with that is that not everybody feels they can share things with everybody. Yeah. They have no thing, nobody to share with. Yeah. And that's what I think your um, piece on the phone lines in Great Britain about the uh, people just want to talk to somebody. Yeah. 
um, uh, there's all kinds of helplines, but what was this called? The silver? The silver line. Yeah. It's the a, silver line. It's like, yeah, it's help. a nonprofit organization in the UK that you can sign up um, and receive phone calls and, and kind of talk to someone on the phone if you're feeling isolated. Yeah. Because I think a lot of it too is, is even though we're connected so much by the internet, as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of barriers to really understanding people that way. Yeah. And, and uh, you may have, as I once had 900 friends on Facebook. Right. And then I thought, how many of these people do I really know or want to know? Yeah. And I don't like the way this is making me feel about myself right. or them. And that's the day I quit. Good for you. I mean, yes, you don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. Nobody's making you. Um, towards the end of the book, uh, you talk a lot about, uh, I know this is something familiar to a lot of our um, attendees, uh, Casey Kasem's long distance dedications. Yeah. A thing that since you were a child, uh, you've been fascinated by these stories. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, it was just always my favorite part of the radio. I mean, I, I loved the radio growing up in a way that I feel like probably teenagers today don't listen to the radio in the way that we did, but um, I, I, it, it, I loved it. I would, I loved kind of tuning into a regular DJ, like my local DJ and then like the national shows and kind of following what was happening. Like it's, it's how I kind of understood um this certain part of, of the culture that I was living in. It was through the radio and it felt very personal. And like, I would talk to my friends about it the next day at school. And when whenever Casey Kasem's Top 40 Countdown came on, like the thing I would most look forward to is the long distance dedications because it was kind of this access to a private life that you don't normally get. And, and it was so, um, it felt so like touching and significant. And like some of them were like silly and like a lot of people like wrote letters to like their dogs or whatever. But there was also like really moving stories um, that I had never heard before. And, and I thought that, and then also them requesting a specific song, which was always just kind of a lovely thing. And you got to hear things that weren't, you know, in the countdown. So I, I, I've never really forgot that feeling with the radio. And then when I was writing this book and writing about my, my dad, who, when he was young, when he was probably the same age as I was, he, he got really into ham radio, into amateur radio. And he would make um, he would stay up at night making uh, a CQ call, the letters C and Q, which is just basically a, a calling out to um, anyone on that wavelength who can answer. It's just like a kind of like, hello, is anyone out there? And then anyone can respond. And I just thought that was such a beautiful, strange, wonderful thing to do. And, and um, over time, the letter C and Q, uh, English speakers started to think of it as CQ, which is how the book um, got its name. And, and I like that idea of kind of calling out there and just being kind of open to what you get back. And I realized I was kind of doing the same thing when I was listening to the radio, except for I, it was, it was a one-sided thing because I was just a listener, but it, but it was interesting to see that parallel between my life and his. Yeah. It's um, a lot of these people, as you mentioned they they were not going to fix anything by this letter. It's possible yeah. the person they're writing to is never going to respond, yeah. but at least it's out there. Yeah, want other people yeah. would know I'm feeling this. Exactly, which is like a wonderful thing. Uh, it's it's a wonderful thing to do. I mean, you know how like they'll tell you like if you can't get something out or if you want to say something to someone you can't say, you're supposed to just write them a letter and not send it. Like it's kind of like the the amplified version of that. Hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's it's quite a trip just thinking about um, that and, and remind you're reminding me too of how if we all listen to the same radio station, we all have things to talk about. Whether yeah. it's an article or, but now there's so many channels for everything. It's true. Uh, we can talk about them online. I mean, there's super fandoms and chat rooms and things still, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not the same shared experience, I guess. And people are wondering, where is the experience for me? And maybe not finding yeah. it. Um, the last three pages of your book really sum it up all to me. Um, when uh, it just says, I want us to use loneliness yours and mine, to find our way back to each other. I want us to play songs for each other on the radio. And when we call out across an airwave, a telephone, or a chat room, or an app, or a city street, or an open field, or our bedroom, I want us each to hear, miraculously, a voice calling back. I mean, that's, whoa. Thanks. That's so nice. It's so nice to hear you read it. Yeah, it's, um, it's a wonderful feeling knowing that there's always hope out there. 
Um, I, I think it's a bit early to go to questions, um, but I did want to also talk about your earlier book, Imagine Wanting Only This. Mm -hmm. This is a more straight ahead biographical story, Yeah. but there's a lot of other things tied into it. So mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about how this came together? Sure. So that, that, that was my first book. And I kind of feel like your first book is, it's hard to even say when you started first working on it, because you kind of always were working on it. You know, it was like all of your feelings ever just kind of ended up in this one, this one book. Um, but I, uh, I started drawing a, it as a comic at the end of my graduate time in graduate school. And it just, it took about seven years. And I just, um, um, kind of taught myself how to draw comics through that book. And it was kind of about a, a fascination with ruins and abandoned places. Yes, in which you go around the world seeking them. Yeah. Uh, because there's, yeah, there, uh, I mean, there's a lot of urban explorers. That's all mm -hmm. a, a thing now, I guess. And you were kind of an early adopter of that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely people who are much more adventurous than I am. But um, mm -hmm. I was sort of like, a, I liked to, um, I was a tourist in it for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, also in this book, uh, I think you're, you're talking a lot about um, um, there's, there's a few incidents in history and geography that mm -hmm. illustrate, you know, the whole things maybe disappearing, being disposable, falling into decay. And one of them is the whole uh, the Peshtigo fire, mm -hmm. which wasn't far from where you grew up, coincidentally. Yeah. But it's a fire a lot of us have never heard of elsewhere. Mm -hmm but it really had a huge impact there and also on things that happened afterwards. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the Peshtigo fire happened coincidentally on the same day of the Great Chicago fire and it was a significantly more deadly and expansive fire. Um, I'm going to mix up, this is this book was from a long time ago, so it's, it's going to, I'm going to mix probably up some of the facts. So probably, definitely do your research after this, but basically um, it burned like a, like a million square acres um, after and it, the, it, the fire was so hot that it actually shot across Lake Michigan, and it was just kind of this this um, this history that I learned about because I grew up right around there, but I realized no one else did, and I became kind of interested in how um, certain certain bits of our history kind of get uh, erased or overlooked. And the, one of the main reasons that that happened was that there were um, all the all the um, telegraph lines fell so that none of the newspapers knew to report about it, but th that didn't happen in Chicago. So all the next day, all across the country, there was coverage of the Chicago fire and no one heard about Peshtigo for days and days because all the correspondents had been um, kind of killed by the fire. Um, but then it was basically the first, it was the only known uh, naturally occurring firestorm uh, in, in history that at this particular moment. And so uh, later scientists during World War II studied it to learn how to replicate um, it during war and do it, uh, by doing fire bombing. So it was uh, strange to me in this way to discover this um, bit of history that is so infrequently known and that it had this tie to such a horrific um, and deadly thing so, so many years later, like the next decade. It's yeah, it's, it's just a proof that sometimes it'll take anything, any opportunity to <laughs> make yeah. a weapon out of it. Yeah. And, uh, you detail very much in there how they reconstructed a lot of the different houses, mm -hmm. furnishings. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, was it just in Nevada or something? Where Utah. They built it? In mm -hmm. Utah. And then tried basically firebombing it to replicate mm -hmm. all these positions to see what would be destroyed. Yeah. And then, of course, over Germany and over um, uh, Japan, that's mm -hmm. exactly what happened. Yeah fire bombs. Also, I know that you're inter you were interested and you made a lot of connections over a, a ghost town uh, in uh, in Arizona, was it? Um, Colorado. Colorado. This is Gelman, yeah. Colorado, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just, I think what's, what's very interesting about America is because it's such a young country. We do have, like, we don't have ain't anything ancient in the same way that if you like go to Europe or something like that, like you don't, you, there's no like you know, 3,000 year old buildings like, like there is in Italy. And so maybe not 3,000, I don't know how many years old, old, yeah. older than here. And so when we have ghost towns or something like that in America, it's very, it feels still very contemporary. It feels very modern. It feels recent. 
Um, and then when we see, you know, like neighborhoods get abandoned and things like that, it's, it kind of gives us that same spooky feeling, but it's, um, it's more frightening somehow because it feels closer to us. It doesn't feel like this, you know, like ancient civilization. It's, it shows kind of like the, the decline of us right now. And, and on the cover of Imagine Wanting Only This, uh, there's an illustration of you at the Detroit airport mm -hmm. with some of the world's tallest uh, abandoned buildings in the yeah. background. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I didn't really know what that's until I saw Koyan and Skatsi and all those, well, they didn't have drones then, but pictures of all these abandoned right. buildings in Detroit. But uh, yeah, it's, um, I guess a lot of it is, in America especially, we rush in for the gold, for the copper, mm -hmm. for the silver, mm -hmm. and then we rush out. Yeah. And we build the community and then we're done with it. Yeah. So a lot is disposable. Yeah, it's it's uh I think it's it is part of like this way of thinking that we have to reframe this idea that like newer is always better or that bigger is better. Like there's this this thing of like where I grew up, your the measure of success was how much land you had around you separating you from your neighbors. And it's like, I understand that, like it's beautiful, the woods are, are beautiful, or maybe you want a garden or whatever. I, I get those, I get the appeal in a certain way, but in another way, it's like, why are we prizing distance in this way? Like communities are wonderful and, and they're there to support, to help you um, survive, not just literally, but also emotionally, which is another important kind of survival of just having someone who knows you nearby. It's like kind of this basic comfort that I think everyone needs. So I, I do think it's, a, it's kind of about reframing and, and kind of going back to, to understanding the more human implications and sort of like the, um, you know, the, the capitalist kind of climb that we're all on to, to be, um, to work harder, to work longer um, in those ways and, and kind of create those divisions. Yeah, um, I think when you were going towards the end of your book, you're also talking about some of these apocalyptic visions you've had of mm -hmm. uh, New York City being underwater, which mm -hmm. um, may or may not happen. Yeah. But we've, we've had some close calls, haven't we? <laughs> we sure have. Yeah. And um, it's just another thing about how a flood could bury the world and everything we built or thought about would be gone. It's like that mm -hmm. uh, book by, no, there's a book about a flood that basically puts the whole world underwater rapidly and then you think about all the stuff that just doesn't matter anymore except getting to the next high ground and, yeah it's real uplifting i hope everyone's enjoying this uplifting chat on a tuesday I, night or just I know, I'm sorry you. am i bumming you oh. out <laughs> you tie it the disposable things the things in the dump the things drowned yeah i um <laughs> No, I, I mean, there is this sort of like, I also think, you know, I, I wrote that book when I was in my late twenties, there is sort of like a, I'm, I'm a real adult now and, and I, I can't, you know, I can't make mistakes in the same way I used to. And I had to get serious about my life that kind of causes you to think in that kind of existential way. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I mean, like the way we handle climate change is a great example of how, um, you, you know, that affects us all equally. And so it's our responsibility to care for our earth, just like it's our responsibility to care for our neighbors because you can't care for your neighbor without caring for your earth. So, um, and the earth that you share. So it is It is kind of like this, um, I think CQ is kind of like this argument for community, um, for community and for community um, engagement. Yes. And also, I don't know if you've read any of uh, Roy Scranton's books. Mm -mm, I haven't. No, he was a, a a, a, a veteran of the Gulf War and he got a divinity degree and now he writes about basically uh, the end of the world. Wow. And what he says about climate change and, and all that stuff is that technology will not save us from mm -hmm. that because technology got us here and so did nature. But what will save us as a species really are the humanities. Mm -hmm. It's art, it's literature, it's conversation, mm -hmm. it's the stories we tell each other and ourselves, yeah. that's what's going to keep us human, not necessarily spaceships to another planet or yeah. our ecologies underground. So yeah. our stories will keep us human. It's true. And I do think conversation is such an essential part. I'm glad you used that word conversation because I do feel like that's not, not that if we just all learn to, to talk to each other, all of our problems will be solved, but um, they certainly become more bearable if we can communicate. Mm -hmm. And you had a, a nice comic about that that I saw. I forget where that was printed. Oh, was yeah. 
Financial Times. Financial no? Times, yeah. Yes, about conversation yeah. and uh, how it's not just talking and listening. There's so much more to it. Mm -hmm. It's a really complicated task. Like thinking, think, think about all the things you have to do when you're having a conversation with someone. Like it's very, uh, there, there's so many elements. You have to, you have to like remember past conversations you've had. You have to um, kind of be thinking about it. Am I boring them? Is this funny? Oops, did I hurt her feelings? Like, am I supposed to ask about that? Or like, whatever happened with her mom? Like, it's all of these things. And then you have to think about also like maintaining eye contact and nodding and giving all of these signals that tell that you're engaged. I mean, it's a lot of things to do at once, which is why it requires so much attention and why it's so important that we um, really direct our focus. Because when we don't, when we don't give those things, those reinforcement things, like when we don't nod our heads, when we don't say mm -hmm, things like that. Um, speakers there's been studies shown that speakers actually are uh they're much worse storytellers they tend to like um they talk longer and they ramble more and they say um more often and they, it feels bad like it feels terrible and it feels like someone isn't listening to you yes there's the illustration of the guy at the table basically telling a story and the woman's just sitting here yeah <laughs> response and it just yeah. it just just failing yeah and, uh, we need some sort of validation but also that it's like you said, there's so many signals and thoughts and things going on in, in your mind uh, about yeah. oh, what do they think? What do I think? Oh, and Tiffany in the chat says the masks, the masks. Make conversation even more challenging. It's so true. You can't see half the face. I know. And lip reading is such a part of conversation in a way that we don't think about. Mm -hmm. Like you understand, you understand people's tone. You understand, like you catch certain things because of, because you can see their face. It just becomes mm -hmm. so much more challenging. Yeah, yeah. The um, I can also see why if somebody becomes hyper aware of all these things going on, that a lot of people are just going to freak out. And it maybe are totally gonna, paralyzing. Yeah, oh, I can't do this. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> I think especially as we've been more separated from each other, you know, we're going to fewer parties, things like that. Like we're not, we're kind of out of practice in that that kind of chat. So it can be a little more exhausting. But it's also why I think it's really important not to avoid it and to and to try to you know, even if you're not going out in public very often to, to have phone calls and things like that, it's really important to keep those muscles up because if we get, if we feel fearful of, of that contact, that yeah. problem will only get exacerbated. Yes. It's got to come back sometime, but not soon enough, I guess. It's, yeah. It's, it's going on. Well, um, I guess another question I have for you in general is what's, what's next? What do you, what sort of things have you got going on in the future? I know you've just changed kind of uh your publication roles uh, you the, yeah i work the believers at the gone and now you're yeah, at the verge i'm at the verge yeah um as an art director during the day but um, my next book is about um that i'm working on is about gossip actually and about um kind of like the origins of gossip and why humans gossip mm -hmm. so there's some good things about gossip not just uh, destroying reputations and totally playing telephone and stuff like that <laughs> yeah there are, um gossip is i mean so basically like the theory is that humans actually developed spoken language in order to gossip mm -hmm. because gossip is a really important bonding tool um because it means you trust someone and it doesn't mean you're just like always saying terrible things about people it just means you're trusting someone with information or you're um you're saying i'm interested in you so i want to share with you this interesting thing but don't tell actually, anybody <laughs> what and don't tell don't anybody, tell anybody. Exactly. Yeah. And that was, um, that was sort of a, like a replacement for, um, for social grooming when primates, the way, and then they would bond, they would groom each other. And, but when you talk, when you gossip, you can, um, that you, that spreads a lot faster. Like it's a faster uh, bonding mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, the gossip is one of the reasons that we're, we're uh, the only species on earth that can have um, such expansive relationships. Like we can, we're the only, um, we're the only species that can learn about things secondhand. Like that we, that if we, if someone's, something's not observed, we can be like, they'll never guess what Carol said last night. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like a, a monkey or a dolphin can't do that. Like if you didn't see Carol say it, hear Carol say it, you're never going to hear it. And so that's part of why we have such, um, complicated social lives and why they're um, in such complex social lives and why they can be so much wider, how we can have so many rings of conversation because you're not only receiving information from that person on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of reminds me of, you know, you have a few mentions of gossip in the book, but I'm also looking forward to, to this because I'm sure you're going to talk about, it is about storytelling. Yeah. It is about expanding 
just like with the written language, we hear stuff from all over. Whether it's accurate or not, that's another topic. Um, yeah, exactly. Also, and it, it's not to say that gossip is always is a universally good thing. I mean, gossip yeah. could be horribly destructive, very mm -hmm. cruel, and it can be extremely mani manipulative. Like some people do gossip in order to kind of get feel superior to get ahead. Mm -hmm. But I'm also interested in why we feel that impulse. I think because it is a very human impulse. Um, and if we've spent so many decades, centuries, really disparaging gossip, like every major religion, mm -hmm. most like every ethicist, philosopher, everyone says gossip Work, is bad. Workplace too, you know, like exactly. it's bad yeah. in the workplace, yeah. Yeah, and so if, if, that's the, if that's what the understanding, why do we still do it? Because um, like uh, Robert Dunbar, who I uh, also, the scientist who I also talk about in CQ, um, did a study that shows that up to 65% of people's conversation could actually be classified as gossip. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing that much, why are we still doing it if, if it's so universally bad? And so I think that's really what I'm interested in investigating. Okay. Well, I'm really looking forward to, to the next book and to keep an eye on uh, whatever you're doing. Now, just so everybody knows, uh, uh, Kristen has a website. Um, guess what? It's kristenradke.com. <laughs> You mentioned that you probably need to update some stuff on it, but I'm sure you'll get to it. I do. I really am very behind, Gary. But, but there's a lot of stuff on there, so you can see the full breadth of what she's uh, you know, done. And it, it's surprising. And, and your stuff has ended up in all kinds of publications. And, and uh, so I think uh, you should be very proud of what you've accomplished Thank you. in, in this. Um, I think this would be a good time to open up uh, the floor to any questions. So I tell you what, if you want to put it in chat or if you would like to speak, please unmute yourself and speak. Anybody? I have a question. This is Laura. I work with Jerry. Hi, Laura. <laughs> um, and I read your book um, about Lone CQ. It was fascinating. Thank you. I am a nonfiction nerd myself. So I love yeah. the fact that you can put all of these um, disparate in parts, information and topics together. It's just fascinating. Um, you said in your book, because this is something a friend of mine and I talk about a lot, um, about how, especially as you get older, it's harder to make friends and it's harder to uh, feel a sense of community. Um, and you mentioned uh, as young as you were, you, you had felt so this deep loneliness. Um, do you feel like that's getting better? Do you feel like you've um, kind of um, felt less lonely? And if so, how did you overcome it? It's a great question. I mean, I, I will say that CQ definitely made me a less lonely person, the process of writing it, because I understand loneliness more now. And for me, uh, that helps me feel more comfortable with it and, and understanding that it does serve this biological function. And it's telling me I need to seek out contact. And so now when I feel lonely, I, I treat it more as like a, a warning sign and something I want to try to fight against, which isn't to say I'm always successful. Like just be, and even if you call someone and have a conversation on the phone, doesn't mean you're going to stop feeling lonely. Um, but it does, it does signal to me that maybe something is missing, which I think is, um, it's value to be reminded of that. You know, it's like if you didn't feel pain when you put your hand on a hot stove, you'd burn yourself all the time. Learning. Yes. Yeah, that was really interesting. And I read that part in the book about how you said this is a message that you, you, you're you being told by yourself that uh, you need to reach out to more people. So uh, yeah, it was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Yeah, thank you. I've got a question in the chat here, our comment from Jan B saying that uh, clinging to the nuclear family model is also destructive and lonely. I guess there's varying a point opinions on that but what do you think about that well yeah i mean i think like everyone has to find their community and how in in their own place like there's no there's no such thing as like one version of a family as we know very clearly mm -hmm. so i think it's it's about finding a people that who you feel very seen by and who you feel like you can be yourself around and that might not be a nuclear family it might be a kind of a family of friends or yes, any so number found of family exactly you have found families that sustain us in many ways Yes. Uh, Shannon, you said you have a question. Go ahead. Um, I want to thank you, Jerry, very much, and Avon Lake Public Library for bringing this great discussion to us. I really appreciate it. And Kristen, I wanted to say you 
right out of the gate, you piqued my interest because you said you sat in New York City and you sketched people. And I was immediately green with envy because that sounds like so fun to me, but it does lead, and I have no artistic skills. So thank you for doing that on behalf of all the rest of us. <laughs> I really admire it. But what I would like to ask is one of the phenomenon that I noticed in recent years is going to the airport where I am surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of people I don't feel lonely necessarily, but I do feel invisible. And it's probably, you might have the similar feeling, I imagine, when you said that you sit in New York City and, and sketch mm -hmm. people, it's that feeling of invisibility. So can you explain, or have you learned anything about sort of the science, that difference between feeling lonely, which I do not, but feeling invisible, which I sometimes like. Yeah. So what is the social totally. disconnect? The social yeah. disconnect. Because sometimes it is nice to be invisible, right? Like when, sometimes when I'm at the airport, like I look rough. I do not want anyone to see me. Like I'm wearing like my weird sweatpants and like it's been a while since I've had a shower, you know? It's like good to be invisible. But I do think, so Emily Dickinson, an Emily Dickinson quote I love is, it, she says that loneliness is the horror to not be, of not being surveyed, the horror to not be surveyed. And I thought that was so interesting because there is often this, um, to feel unseen or to feel invisible is also to feel lonely as a kind of loneliness. I think sometimes it's an aloneness that can feel really good. Like if you, if you want like a break, I think anyone who spends a lot of time on zoom, um, has, we realized that kind of like zoom fatigue of feeling like you have to be like this, you know, all the time someone might look at you and that's very tiring. So to be invisible, you know, to literally turn your screen off is a, is a great relief. So there are moments like that, I think too. So I think it's really double-edged, but it's a great question. And invisibility is kind of like you said, it's like the cool kids in the lunch table ignoring you while they're discussing their plans. Yeah. Or it can also be um, you're at a concert or something and everybody mm -hmm. else is loving this band and you're just kind of going, I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> what am I doing here? A lonely, a lost in a crowd. Sometimes you yeah, are, whether absolutely. it's personal or whether it's not. Yeah, absolutely. And feeling like you're you're having an incongruent experience with other people is a very lonely feeling. Like if you've ever been like really excited to show someone a movie that's like your favorite movie and then they're like, it's fine. Yeah. It feels very bad. It feels like suddenly you you had this experience you would imagine sharing and it felt um it felt more like you were alone. Well, I've had that experience recently. In fact, I think I shared it with you and everybody here is my playlist of lonely songs. Oh. I don't know if you got a chance to to listen to it or not. No, I didn't see it. I'm so excited to listen. Do you have Apple Music? I do have Apple Music. All right. I, I sent it to you. I'll send it again. Oh, thank you. I sent it to everybody here as well. It was a labor of love on Saturday. Um, okay. Cool. I, also, I see that one of our guests, Rose Coffee, has a question. So why don't you unmute yourself and go ahead, Rose. Hi, Kristen. I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your book a lot. Thank you. Um, I, you talk about pop culture in a couple of different places. And I don't know if you were trying to draw upon the differences between men and women in pop culture, but it seemed kind of like you were, mm -hmm. um, where men were kind of viewed as heroes for being lonely and women were kind of seen as the worst possible yes. case yes. if they were lonely. Yes. And do you think that's a more nature thing or a nurture thing like we are like like that because society tells us that's how we sh should feel or do you think that just by the nature of who we are uh that's how men and women are yeah I think it's totally like a sexist completely incorrect societal thing like it's there's there's this idea that like a, a man who's alone is I mean it's like the age-old like if a man is single, he's a bachelor. If a woman is single, she's a spinster. I mean, come on. Everybody wants to be a bachelor. That's cool. Nobody wants to be a spinster, but they're the same thing. There's no difference. So I, I think it's like, it's, it's also like this, um, I talk, I write a lot about Sandra Bullock in the, in the book and how Sandra Bullock has like spent her whole career playing like a lonely lady through, throughout her, pretty much her entire public life. And you have no idea why she's lonely, right? Yeah. <laughs> she shouldn't and, be, but she is. I know. And she's, and I think it's interesting that like this kind of America sweetheart is always cast in this way because I think we want to see people, lonely people on television. I think it make, you know, nobody wants to watch a movie about like a totally popular, fulfilled person. Like that just sounds like, who cares? That sounds boring. 
Um, but I think it's very interesting the way with women that it's kind of viewed as like um, a kind of a personal failing and with men it's viewed as kind of like this like cool bravado thing, which is just totally garbage and incorrect. Do I'd like to read it. That, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, got more rows? Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Do you think that leads more to like what you were saying that kind of how the mass shootings in society now, like uh, teenage boys mm -hmm. are raised on that lonely cool guy thing? Do you think that plays into it? Good question. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not a doctor or scientist, so it's hard for me to say, but I do think that like the fact that we um, like suggest to boys that they shouldn't be open about their feelings or they shouldn't express uh, how they feel. And the fact that um, often boys aren't socialized to have close close friends um, in the same way that young girls are. And and we we learn so much from our friends, especially when we're young in those, stage, in those stages. I mean, it's a really important part of kind of figuring out who you are. So we're it's very, it's, it deprives someone to suggest that there's something wrong with that. Okay, great question. Um, I noticed there's a question in the chat from uh, my wife, uh, Victoria. Do you mind unmuting yourself and just uh, going with that whole pandemic thing? Sure. My question um, was, I just kind of wanted to know if you kind of like saw the pandemic coming um this biological disaster that just kind of forced us to to isolate ourselves um do you think that maybe this was something that we were kind of yearning for kind of create that we kind of wanted this to happen i mean i certainly did not want this to happen because this sucks i really hate i we're at this point i mean it's just like it's so awful we've watched so we've lost so many people it's been so painful and it's caused us to be separated from each other, like in a very literal way. And I'm I'm quite worried about how we're going to rebuild our communities and how we're going to go back to that. You know, will certain things just never go back? Will we just always do certain things on Zoom and and not gather in person, or or view gathering as a um, inconvenience rather than as like this um, real privilege to be able to get to do? And I think any of us can see it now as a great privilege to be able to gather safely. It's, it's um, kind of like uh, June and July last summer was a moment. Oh, it was so good. It felt like it was over and then slam. I know. So um, I don't know. I, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in what will happen. Um, I, I do think what it is interesting of there is this kind of, there was for some people, I think, who, who got to isolate more, a kind of sense of relief to kind of get off the, um, the treadmill of the everyday routines. And so I hope it does also cause us to kind of reevaluate the way we were living our lives and, and make changes while we can um, about things we want to be different. If you're stuck with yourself, there is time to re reflect on exactly. yourself as well as others. Um, I think I got one more question here, uh, Shannon put in the chat. Uh, just if you could share what your experience has been like marketing graphic nonfiction. Uh, you know, and Shannon is neither an artist, an author or a librarian but it's a fascinating new, new genre. And what have you learned from doing it? Um, it's a good question. I, um, it's, it's not a new genre, but it is a genre that's probably getting more attention than it always was. Um, just because I think there are more publishers who are, who are open to it and things like that. And there's um, more readers who are, who are also kind of willing to try something that looks a little different or seems a little different, but there's, um, there's a really, it's a really wonderful um, kind of like fruitful space and and there's amazing, I mean, definitely encourage your library to get as many graphic, graphic nonfiction books as possible because there's really exciting things happening there. But in terms of marketing it, I mean, I um, I don't know, like I I was really lucky to, to end up at Pantheon, my publisher, because I love the graphic books they do. You should check out their other um, titles. And I just felt um, very fortunate. And then, you know, you just, it's all, it's just like kind of a grind to keep things, to keep things going and to try to get work out there. Okay. Well, it's coming up on the hour. And so I just wanted to see if there's anything else you wanted to say in summary, something we haven't covered, something that maybe we should think about. I mean, I'll just say um, thanks for having me and thanks um, 
I love, I'm, I wish we could be that together in person, but libraries are so important to me. I, libraries were, were definitely the reason that I, I never would have become a writer if my mom didn't take me to the library a couple times a week mm. um, in my really small town growing up. And I just spent so much time there and it's um, always great to go back to a library even virtually. So thanks. There's, there's a very heavy book, I'll send you the link to it, about librarianship, uh, about the, uh, I'll send you the link to it, but, and I have two copies of it. It's really saying that what we are about is facilitating conversation. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of neat graphics in there. <laughs> yeah. You would just nerd out on it, uh, totally. So I'll send I you the link Yeah, to I would that. love to read it. Yes. And also we got uh, Tiffany saying she teaches uh, English language learners Ooh. and graphic novels are a great way to get into that. Oh, I love that. That's so, such a good idea. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I wanted to say um, then thank you again for, for visiting and for sharing this thing with you. Just for fun, I'm now posting my playlist link here in the chat. Oh, yay. So you can go, go to town on that. Awesome. Um, and uh, yeah. This book has really meant a lot to me and obviously to several of your others. So keep up and someday, someday, please come to Avon Lake and say hi. You got it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great night, everybody. Okay, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you.